Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Hear these words of truth. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I am going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you all this time. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name, so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thank you. Oh, so good to see you all this morning. It's a quiet week with spring break and all of that, and opportunity to kind of gather. The weather's warm. It feels a little bit like spring outside. So we're so glad that you've joined us this morning for worship. Let's pray together as we begin. Lord, we're thankful for all that you do for us, for bringing us to this place for a gorgeous Sunday to gather to worship you. We ask that you pour your spirit on us, that we might hear this important word from Jesus afresh. Give us new eyes and ears and open our hearts in the name of Christ. Well, this is the season in the United Methodist Church when a lot of pastors are getting phone calls about going to new appointments, and uh, I am not getting one of those phone calls. Um, I was meeting with the bishop a couple weeks ago, and I was very adamant that uh, I wanted her to leave me alone. I might have used another word in there, too, but uh, I said, leave me alone, and uh, so hopefully they will honor that. That's, that, that's the plan. We're going to do that. But I do have friends who are moving, and, and I did my doctoral dissertation and wrote a book on clergy transition. So every year at this time, people call me up and ask for advice. And so a friend of mine called and said, you know, I'm thinking about the farewell speech. How do I say goodbye to my congregation? What kind of things do I need to say? And th- there are a lot of models to draw from when it comes to farewell speeches, For example, there's the great Lou Gehrig's speech, you know, when he left the Yankees having contracted the disease and he stands there in the midst of one of the shortest speeches, but one of the greatest. I I feel like today I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. That's a powerful image that we'll remember forever. You might think if you're a history nerd of Lincoln's farewell speech to the people of Illinois before he went on to Washington and the only time he went back to Illinois was after he was assassinated. He was buried there. We might think of President Dwight Eisenhower's farewell speech, which was prescient, a warning about the military-industrial complex. Or we might think of George Washington or any one of a, a million famous speeches about saying farewell. But I don't think there's any speech that's as important as the farewell speech that Jesus gives in today's lesson. It's called the farewell discourse in John. We're going to be spending a couple of weeks in it. It goes from chapter... 13, the end of chapter 13, all the way through chapter 17. So we're going to look at that in some detail this morning. I hope you have your Bibles with you, break them out. We're going to give them a workout this morning. Actually, the discourse begins in chapter 13, where 
Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to the Father. Actually, John gives us that kind of understanding that Jesus has come from the Father and is returning to the Father, which is a relational term rather than a geographical term, as we'll see here in a minute. It's about the mutual indwelling of the Father and the Son. And so this discourse is how the it's about how the disciples enter into that indwelling relationship with, when Jesus is no longer present with them. Of course, he's going away for a time, but he will return. And so this farewell speech comes after the foot washing event that we talked about last week. Uh, there at verse 31, we learn that Judas has departed to do his work of betraying Jesus. He's gone off into the night, slunk off into the night, and now Jesus speaks about his glorification, which will come through his death on the cross, which chronologically speaking, uh, begins here with chapter 13, 14, and it goes into chapter 21, but the crucifixion looms on the morrow as the text reads. The cross, of course, is where Jesus is going. That overshadows this whole farewell discourse. And so who God is who Jesus is and who they are to each other and to us is going to be fully revealed in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. We know that, but the disciples don't quite know it yet, and they don't know why they can't go along with Jesus. Only Jesus can do this work of redemption, but the disciples have a role to play. Chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus gives them a new commandment. That's why we call Maundy Thursday, Monday. Thursday. It's from the Latin mandatum novum, a new commandment. And he gives them this commandment, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. Jesus demonstrates the standard of that love in his own person and in what he's about to do. He tells his disciples also that greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he's about to do, not just for the disciples, but for the whole world. Now, Peter pushes back as Peter is wont to do. I, I think Peter kind of represents us in the midst of this uh, text always in the Gospels because he always says the thing that everybody's thinking, uh, but, uh, but it's not quite right. He's not quite there yet. And so he says, Lord, where are you going? And he doesn't understand that Jesus is about to go to the cross, not somewhere down the line, not a hypothetical, but it's going to happen tomorrow. And so Peter says, I, I will give up my life for you. I will, I will die for you because he's thinking about it hypothetically. If someday perhaps I was presented with the opportunity, I'm pretty sure that I would die for you. Don't we love to do that? If that, such and such happens someday, I'm going to do this. And then we go, well, well, maybe not. You know, that, that's part of it. And so Jesus tells his, disi his disciple, before the cock crows three times tomorrow, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny me. And that brings us to chapter 14. Disturbing things are about to happen, but Jesus tells his disciples to stand firm even when it looks like evil and death are about to have their way. And so he says to them, trust in God, trust also in me. Notice here at the beginning that Jesus pairs faith in himself with faith in God the Father. That's what John has been telling us all along, that Jesus and the Father are one and the same. And so he's laying out again a Christology. This is telling us who Jesus is. Now, this would be a problem for most Jews of Jesus' day. It's one of the charges against him, a charge of blasphemy that he claimed to be equal with God. Some people go around and say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Uh, read the text. It's very clear that he does. But we have seen that there are always layers of meaning in what Jesus says in John's gospel. There's a physical meaning, a spiritual meaning, there's a present meaning and a future meaning, and all that becomes bound up here. And so Jesus' description of his destination, his returning to the Father, follows this pattern. Now look at chapter 14, verse 2. Famous text, we use this a lot at funerals. Jesus says, my father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place where I am going. Now, this is very interesting because when we read it, we automatically think of Jesus' father's house as what? 
heaven. My father's house are many rooms. Actually, King James says mansions. And so we've come up with this theology that says that, that our whole goal is to go off to this place that Jesus is preparing that will have our, our mansion in heaven, 2,800 square feet, pool, uh, you know, gold rims. Uh, it'll be very Trumpian uh, in some ways, you know, around that. Probably that's what we're looking for. Or maybe you envision a log cabin or something else, whatever that looks like. But that's not really what the text is talking about. Remember that this is less about geography than it is about relationship. Jesus is returning to the Father's house. The only other reference to the Father's house in John's gospel is in chapter 2, where it refers to the temple. The temple was the place where heaven and earth met, where God was to dwell among the people. Now, we learn in chapter 2, if you remember back there, that when Jesus goes into the temple, he turns over the tables as an acted parable of judgment against the temple. And they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And he says, tear down this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they, they are mind are blown. But what is Jesus talking about? That he is the new temple. He is the one in whom heaven and earth meet. He is the one that represents God's presence, God's dwelling with his people. What did John tell us in chapter 1, verse 14? The word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally tabernacled, templed among us, relationship. In other words, the Father's house is where Jesus is. And when we are in relationship with Jesus, when we follow and obey his commands, especially his command to love, we dwell with him and the Father now and in the future. This is a critical teaching for disciples, both then and now, because the gospel is not just about going to heaven when we die, but about the present and active relationship we have with the Father through Jesus via the Holy Spirit. That relationship sets us up then for a particular way of life, the way that is demonstrated by Jesus. It's the way of the cross. This is what Jesus means by preparing a place. His death opens up the way to eternal life. His return in the resurrection secures our future resurrection. So we are incorporated into his death and his resurrection, given new birth and made part of his new creation. That's the theology that John has been giving us all along. That's the gospel, the good news. We are caught up in this death and resurrection of Jesus and given new life, not just in the future, but in the present. Remember that for John, eternal life starts now. God's ultimate purpose in Jesus is to bring full and abundant life now and in the future. Jesus says to his disciples at the end of that, you know the place where I'm going, and the disciples are still confused. Thomas, who we know later is doubting Thomas, is always the one asking the blunt question. So how can we know the way? Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? They're not grasping this. How could they? See, if we're not clear where Jesus is going, then it's virtually impossible for us to follow him. A lot of people try. They assume that Jesus is going where they want to go. They assume that, that they've got things figured out and they will adapt Jesus to whatever path it is that they've decided to walk. A distorted view of God leads us to a distorted invention of Jesus. If your God is all puppies and rainbows and unicorns, then you expect Jesus and the life he leads to be all puppies and rainbows and unicorns too. Well, what about this cross stuff? We don't need that. It's one of the great critiques of what's going on in many places in the church, the critique of Protestant liberalism that Richard Niebuhr gave years, years ago when he said that goes something like this, a God without wrath brought people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. That ain't gonna fly not going to fly here for Jesus. Because God's ultimate purpose in Jesus is to bring full and abundant life now and in the future. But that life comes at the cost of a cross. A distorted view of God leads to a distorted invention of Jesus. He becomes a guru, a buddy, a sage, a teacher, a dispenser of wisdom. But Jesus' answer to Thomas makes it very clear who he is. Where are you going? How do we get there? I am, I am, remember, the way, the truth, 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Note again, the destination is a relationship, going to the Father to dwell with him. How does one get there? Only through following Jesus' way, truth, and life. So let's break those down here for a minute. First, let's look at the ways Jesus is the way. Throughout the Gospel of John, we read over and over again, Jesus saying that he and the Father are one. To see him is to see God. Verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. Can you just, can you just pull back the curtain and show us the Father? That will be quite enough. And Jesus says, basically, have you not been paying attention, Philip? I, I've been doing this the whole time. Everything I've said and I've done has revealed my connection, my relationship, my intimacy, my oneness with the Father. Those who want to go to the Father to be part of his family then will follow and say and do what Jesus has said and done. Indeed, Jesus says they will do even greater things because Jesus' power is available to them via the Holy Spirit. And so he invites his disciples to ask him anything. And he will do it. Can you imagine? Ask me for anything and I will do it. It's not a blank check, but an invitation. An invitation to walk this way. You just had Aerosmith go through your mind, but there, I know. Walk this way. See, this is the culmination of everything John has told us at, to this point that there is only one God, only one manifestation of that God in the person of Jesus Christ. That John will not allow us to bend our definitions of God and Jesus. They are pointed and specific. They are grounded in the scriptures and in the witness of the Spirit. But neither will John allow us to bend our definition of the way that Jesus is the way either. That way is specific. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of sacrificial, costly love. Look at verse 21. Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is not squishy love. This is not simple positive regard. This is not simple acceptance of whatever it is that you've got to bring. It's love demonstrated in obedience. It's a way that excludes every other way. To say Jesus is the way, the way, is offensive in a pluralistic world. We love to manufacture gods of our own making. We've been doing it since the beginning. We want to have a God who matches our particular will. To say that Jesus is the only way is is, well, that seems offensive. That doesn't seem terribly inclusive of all the other places that, and ways that are out there. I, someone said to me recently, they said, well, you know, pastor, come on. All religions are simply different paths up the mountain to find God in whatever way that people perceive him. Isn't that, isn't that true? And I said, no. If you say that, you don't understand Christianity. Because Christianity is not about going up a mountain on a path to find God. Christianity is about the fact that the God of the universe came down to us in person in Jesus Christ. That is radically different than every other worldview. It's either the way or it is not the way. And that requires a decision from us. The way is via a person. He is the way or he is no way. First John, which we've been studying in our Lenten series, um, says this, chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, Who is the liar? Isn't it the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This person is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father, but the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Boom. Drop the mic. He is either the way or he is no way. C.S. Lewis put it this way. You must make your choice. Either Jesus was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. 
or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. If you want to know the one true God and the way to him, there is only one path, and that way runs through Jesus and the way he calls us to follow. It's not an easy way. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of self-denial. It's the way of self-giving love. Only that way leads to life. That Jesus is also the truth clarifies this further. Now, the rabbis of Jesus' day would, would often talk about God in terms of truth. They would use that as a title because truth in Hebrew contains the, word, the letters of the first middle and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. Truth. Jesus speaks often about truth, about it being the ultimate reality. The truth is the framing story of his death and resurrection, the truth of his teaching, the truth of his commandments, truth embodied in a person. At the end of the text, chapter 18, As Jesus goes to trial before Pilate, Jesus says this to the Roman governor, I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. But Pilate, being a Roman, a secularist, part of the government, a creature of the culture of his time, replies with a question. What is truth? What is it? It's the same question that many people in our culture ask today. In fact, the whole culture is about that. In our culture, truth is relative. How often do you hear people say stuff like this? Well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That's your spirit. Speak your truth. As if there was no such thing as absolute truth. That runs against the laws of the universe. I mean, is gravity true for you? Uh, it's true for me. I'm increasingly trying to keep it from being more so, right? Always. There is truth. And we have to recognize that. Jesus is clarifying that there is such a thing as truth, and he is it. He promises the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will reinforce that truth. This is the truth with which we must come to terms. That's the choice that we are confronted with. Again, back to 1 John chapter 5. John says this, The one who believes in God's Son and has the testimony within. The one who doesn't believe God has made God a liar because that one has not believed the testimony that God gave about His Son. And this is the testimony. God gave eternal life to us and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have God's Son does not have life. John says you've got to pay attention to the truth in order to have life. And that's why Jesus says he is also the life. Remember all the way back to chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 10.10, I came that they might have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. In chapter 15, which is the second part of this discourse, Jesus describes the life-giving relationship that he has with his followers as a vine and branches. The disciples are designed for fruitfulness, but they can only be fruitful if they're connected to the vine, if they receive the life that he offers to them. Chapter 15, verse 8, My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. Way, truth, life. The good farewell speech summarizes what has happened in the past, affirms those who hear it, and challenges those who hear it. To think about the future. Jesus touches all of those bases and much, much more in this speech. And if you use our devotional guide this week, you will read through it in some detail. 
Most of the time when people give a speech like this, they're about to retire, walk off into the sunset, walk away. We know Jesus is not walking away. He's going to rise from the dead. He's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit as the constant presence, Father, Son, and Spirit all together. And He's going to return. He's going to the Father as the completion of this part of His mission, but also to inaugurate the new creation. He's still living and active among us in the Spirit, confronting us and calling us to decide whether or not we will follow Him, the way, the truth, and the life. But let's be clear here, folks. Following Him is a rough road, particularly today. Claiming that He is the way, the way, means forsaking all the other ways that the world wants us to walk. Claiming that He is the truth is putting a stake in the ground in a culture where truth is a moving target. Jesus knew that claiming He is truth will not make you popular. Chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. However, I have chosen you out of the world and you don't belong to the world. That's why the world hates you. You're always going to be weird to the world because you're following a different way. You are always going to be, as people love to say now, on the wrong side of history. Don't you love that? I'm a historian. How do you get to determine history in advance? And by the way, I'm not concerned about being on the wrong side of history. I'm worried about being on the wrong side of his story. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. While this is a rough road, it's the only road that leads to life. Jesus gave his disciples hope that this present suffering won't last forever. That in the end, he is the way, the truth, and the life that conquers the world. The last words of this speech, chapter 16, verse 33. Let's drop the mic moment. He says this, I've said these things to you so that you will have peace in me. In the world you will have distress, but be encouraged. I have conquered the world. Boom. And he will do it on a cross and in an empty tomb. He will do it for you and for me so that we might have a way that leads to life. The way, the truth, and the life. Back to my friend who was asking for advice about his farewell speech. I wrote a lot in a book that I wrote about how to say goodbye and do that effectively and everything, but, but only two words or three words came to mind, and they were the words that, that John Wesley spoke to Francis Asbury as he was sending Asbury to America to bring the Methodist movement over here. Three words. Offer them Christ. If we are his followers, those should be our first words and our last words. Offer them Christ. What will we do with Jesus? That's the question that we are confronted with and that we confront the world with. It's a question we have to answer every day. Is he the way, the truth, and the life for your life? What you do with him will be the most important decision you will ever make. Bar none. And if he is the way, the truth, and the life in your life, then... To whom will you offer him? To whom will you explain his story? Not just with your words, but with your life. Because one day we're going to all walk off the stage for the last time. I told you last week, a couple weeks ago, that I'm already writing my own funeral sermon so nobody screws it up later. I want the last word. Sometimes we don't get to speak the last word. I read a 1,500-page biography of Winston Churchill. Oof, what a life. But you know, as, as many great speeches as Churchill gave, he never got to give a farewell speech because he had a stroke and was una- unable to do so. He never got to say those last words. We may not get to say them either, but we will have a record of what we did with our lives. What will your record say? What will your record say about what you did with Jesus? 
Will you have walked the way? Or not the way? That's the question that confronts us. And one I hope you'll think about today and every day. John Wesley, who founded our Methodist movement, had some last words. You knew he would. But they were simple. One sentence. The best of all is God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. May our last words, the testimony of our lives, be full of grace, hope, and joy because we have followed the way, the way of Christ. As we come to a time of prayer, I invite you to take a few moments of silence to consider where you are in the midst of this. What will you do with Jesus? Maybe you've been walking that way for a while. Maybe you've stepped off the path a few times. That's okay, too. He welcomes us back and orders our steps. As we prepare to come to the table to receive the grace that he offers, let us consider the one who is the way. Father God, as we come to this place this morning, we, we come with these words ringing in our ears, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that we can't modify those or prevaricate around them or exegete them away. They are plain truth for plain people. The disciples began to recognize that way after Jesus was risen from the dead. We're on the other side of that. We know what it means. Lord, I pray today that not only as individuals but as a church that we would be known as a people who walk your way, who speak your truth, and who live your life. Show us how to do so. Send your spirit upon us to strengthen us for the task. For we know that our ultimate dwelling is with you, you who made us and love us and seek to make us whole. In the name of Christ, we pray.